will be the very best like no one ever was. Danger to how much did that theme song song slap when you were a kid? I mean, even now, I don't know if they still play the same theme song for Pokemon. I don't know if it's the same one, but I remember waking up as a kid and hearing that theme song and literally my body electrifying. Like, Pokemon is on! Yes! If anyone's listening here and they're not watching on YouTube, I've got my Pokemon plushes in the background. I was a huge fan of Pokemon. Had a tremendous impact on me. And if you must know, my starter was Bulbasaur. My starter was Bulbasaur, but you know why? Because I always thought that everybody always a big Charmander fan. Squirtle's pretty damn cool too, and I like Squirtle and Charmander, don't get me wrong. But I always felt like Bulbasaur, even just the the voice, uh, the voice Tara Sands, I believe, is the voice of, of Bulbasaur. But Bulba! Bulbasaur! I loved like that scrappy raspiness to Bulbasaur. I mean, Squirtle kind of had that too, like Squirtle, Squirtle! But everybody like thought, you know, because of the Squirtle squad, that he was like super cool. Like I liked being an outlier. And that's where my love for Bulbasaur came. And Divasaur and Venusaur. You know, um, unfortunately, you get your butt whooped by Charmanders if you're a Bulbasaur fan. Gosh, I was such a big Pokemon fan. I remember the first time I had my Game Boy uh, Pokemon Red stolen from me from the bus. One of my dear friends, I won't name them and out them. I remember I lost my game and I was like, where is it? Mom, my Pokemon! And, uh... I get on the bus the next day, and I remember a, a buddy of mine saying, "Like, hey guys, guess what I got? I got the I got Mew." And I'm like, "How did you get a Mew?" Back when I was growing up, you had to go to the mall, and they had events where they would give you these Pokemon. You had to like do trading things with people from Game Freak, and they'd give you the Mew before like that uh, thing where you could move the the boulder, or was that from Mewtwo? I can't remember. I don't think you could have gotten Mew unless it was like by the glitch in the in the grass. Anyway, he stole my Mew, and I was furious, and I said, I know that's mine. Let me see your Pokedex. And we went through, and I said, I know my that, that, my, my, my Venusaur is that level. And he wound up giving me it back, and we became really good friends after that. So it was a really good lesson in humility for him. What does all this mean? Why am I talking about Pokemon right now when you're all trying to learn about the industry? Well, who knows? Maybe you want to work on Pokemon in, in one way or another. Well, this would be a great podcast for you to listen to because we have... The incomparable Tom Wayland on, who was the voice director of Pokemon for, I think, like eight seasons, worked on so many episodes. We get into that um, on this episode. We talk about his expansive career working on Pokemon, being kind of a, a, a utility player on the show and filling in in every which way possible of making that show come to, to fruition. Uh, he worked on it in the Four Kids iteration. Uh, which was kind of like the Saturday morning cartoons um, gro when I was growing up, at the very least. And uh, he's also worked on tons of things. I mean, he was, you know, worked on Yu-Gi-Oh, Ninja Turtles, Mobile Suit Gundam. Uh, he was even in Super Smash Brothers. He plays uh, in in Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. He uh, plays Arceus, um, and I believe one of the other Pokemon. He's the voice of that. So he's been working on Pokemon for gosh, twenty years, I believe, at this point. I met Tom many years ago when I was living in New York City, and he kind of gave me my first foray, true foray, into dubbing, which is when you're taking a piece of content that's in one language, and you're putting an English adaptation, or any other language adaptation for me was English, um, onto it. And his company was called 3Beep. It is called 3Beep Productions right now, where he's the supervising director. And uh, it comes from the beep, beep, beep. And then you go. That's when you, as the voice actor, are going to record your lines on that third beep you come in. Um, and I learned so much from Tom. And he was very kind to take a risk on me. I mean, I don't know how much of a risk because I'm going to – listen, I'm a pretty talented guy. Right? I'm a pretty talented guy. You know, I don't know a little bit about what I'm doing here, all right? Uh, I have a background in theater, and I've been doing this for a long time. I know I look 14. And I play 14, but I've been in this industry for a minute and I, I, I paid my dues in, in many different ways. And, and Tom caught wind of that and, and saw something to me, thought I'd be valuable to, to work with him. And on this show, we talk about that. How do you get in the room for some of these production companies as an actor? How do you make yourself stand out? Uh, what are kind of the, the, the things you should avoid as an actor? How can you make your, yourself a uh, more valuable actor? things to 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 take note of definitely have your pen and paper out on this one for real there are so many valuable pieces of knowledge in this episode um i learned a lot even listening to him and knowing him for so long uh it really was so many nuggets of wisdom 
Uh, we even talk about directing too and voice directing, you know, how he got started as a producer and then eventually working in uh, uh, as a director in, in voiceover. So if you have either of those pursuits as an actor, being a voice director, starting your own company, which he does, and, and adapting these things, this is going to be the episode for you. So uh, have your ears peel, peeled. Ear, ears peeled? Ears open? Eyes peeled, right? You'd peel your eyes open. You'd keep your ears open. I don't know why they would close, though. Either way, get ready. We're interviewing Tom Wayland here, so stick around. This one's going to be a really, really, really informative episode of the Points of Experience podcast. Tom, honestly, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, for, for we, we for, for everybody here, we've got Tom Wayland on the show. Uh, the supervising director at 3B Product Productions. If you don't know his work, he was also the voice director on Pokemon, tons of other titles. You've worked on G.I. Joe, Yu-Gi-Oh, yeah. Ninja Turtles as Jammerhead, Mobile Suit Gundam, yeah. uh, the, a, a recent Pinocchio, which is apparently not the Pinocchio with Pauly Shore, to my disappointment, I believe. It's not the Pinocchio with Pauly Shore, although he's completely welcome to be an our Pinocchio <laughs> if he wants. So, <laughs> he, I mean, yeah. he might be into it. You know, you can get the, uh, the, the, we, the weasel version of Pinocchio, which is maybe oh, awesome. going to bring in all the hip kids. Uh, and you've also voiced over two, and, and you've also voiced characters in over 240 episodes of Pokemon. Did you know that? Uh, I, I guess. <laughs> I mean, that sounds about right. It sounds about yeah. right. I, I voiced a lot of, a lot of stuff and a lot of different things, but yeah, there was a lot of that once upon a time. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's I, I, when I saw that, I was like, holy shit. Holy shit. Yeah. That's, well, that's I mean, you know, of, uh, that was, uh, we we worked on that show over at Duart for like eight years, so you know, it was it, I, it and, adds up. And, well, you know, the thing that I always said about Pokemon uh, was it was the best job and the worst job in the animation business for the same reason because it never ends. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it was great recurring work, but you know, after a while, sometimes you're like. Ugh. Yeah. Something else, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, that, there it is. Listen, so, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with stability, but I'm the same way. I have, <laughs> um, that's why I could never hold down a job for longer than six months when I was growing up because I just get bored. I just get bored of things and I <laughs> want to move you on. Go. Not to say I wouldn't hate being on like a show like Seinfeld for, you know, I, <laughs> sure. Give me the George Costanza problem. Yeah. I'll take it. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, Lisa Ortiz, who, who, you know, I've always been close with, like, she took over. Uh, and she's been directing that show for for years now, uh, yeah. almost as long as me. And I think at some point she'll she'll sort of surpass me in, in in the number of episodes pretty soon. But I remember in the beginning she's like, "Wow, she's like, how'd you do this for so long?" And I'm like, "I have a mortgage and kids." <laughs> so I'm like, "That's how." Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. honestly, finding that kind of work, and we'll get into more of uh, like how you even got started doing that type of stuff. It's like I mm -hmm. think. A lot of actors are, you know, finding a reoccurring gig is one of the hardest things you could do. So many shows go for a season yeah. or two seasons yeah. and that's it. So it's kind of oh, uh, Pokemon is, is a unicorn, uh, no yeah. doubt. And I mean, uh, and uh, the, a couple other. I mean, the only things you could really compare it to is something like South Park yeah. and The Simpsons. And, you know, One Piece has been around for a long time, too. But still, I mean, 25 plus years. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times, especially like when you, you know, people who got started on a thing like that suddenly they're like oh well every show will just be around forever no no <laughs> no <laughs> nope <laughs> absolutely not absolutely no, not if you not do it you, you are extremely lucky um yeah. so let's go back to the beginning here um am i correct <laughs> did you you grew up in new jersey you grew I up did. yeah yes. all right so did i where where in jersey did you grow up so i grew up in um morris county new jersey so uh you know i I lived in Morristown, New Jersey, till I was like seven, and then I lived in Cedar Knolls and Morris Plains, which are sort of the same thing. And uh, you know, I went to Whippany Park High School, um, which I loved. Uh, you know, so I I really liked growing up in Jersey. It was it was good. Um, and uh, and I moved to New York City like when I started college, and I lived there for ten years, and then I moved back to New Jersey which is still where I live right now. I'm yeah. not in New Jersey right now. Right now I am in uh, a little town called Clinton Township, Michigan, which is just north of Detroit. Oh. So I'm, uh, I'm here um, with my uh, 
my, my, my lady, uh, we're, you know, we were visiting her parents and stuff and I'm like, so I'm, I'm up here. Oh gosh. Uh, well, now I, now I definitely owe you something for doing oh, this while you're on it, a, <laughs> on vacation. So gosh. Oh, oh, it's not a vacation. It's not a vacation. It's just, you know, it's, it's time uh, away. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, we drove out here cause I love driving. Yeah. Um, so it's the thing, you know, she was like really missing her parents and, you know, cause with all the stuff that's going on the past couple of years, you know, yeah, it's yeah. been hard to do things like that. And I'm like, let's just go, <laughs> and, you know, get in the car and go. Yeah. And here we are. So, you know, I'm hanging that, out. That was literally me today when my, my fiance, she was like, my, uh, my aunt is in Palm Springs. And I was like, me though, unlike you being a, a, a good partner, I was like, it's three and a half hours in LA traffic. I don't want to do that. And I stopped my feet the whole way, but it was amazing time and I'm glad I did it. So and three and a half hours in LA traffic means she lives like a half a mile away. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's, it would have taken an hour and a half, but you know, and, and now I'm doing every back road imaginable through, nice. uh, the, you know, the, wherever, I don't even know where I was. I don't even know any of these streets or towns anyway. Uh, so gr- yeah. uh, unlike Jersey, where I feel like people who drive, they, they have a, uh, they have a place to be people want to get home they came from new yeah. york they're trying to get home they don't want to sit in traffic yeah. so that's the difference between uh la and jersey um but very similarly i grew up in jersey moved to new york spent around eight years there so you where, did, also, where were you in jersey uh monmouth county hazlitt is where oh, i grew God, up so okay, I for us for anyone here who's familiar with jersey we we often identify things either by turnpike or or garden Exit state numbers. parkway exits so yep. i was 117 off the parkway yeah. for anyone yeah, for me, that it's, matters it's, too. It's Route 80. I was I'm it's, Route 80. Uh, if, if you're going west, it's exit 42. If you're going east, it's exit 38. So, yes. Yeah. Route 80. <laughs> it's uh, I, uh, some of some of the worst traffic on Route 80 during rush hour. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so w- you you eventually went to NYU, correct? And you studied acting. I did. Yes, I got a degree in acting from NYU. Uh, I went to the Circle in the Square uh, acting studio. Uh, and then I did the film and TV acting studio for just like a semester. And then I interned, um, stone street. Yeah. I, that's not what they called it back then, but ah. it's the, it, but it is stone street. It's the same thing. I actually got to teach at stone street, huh. um, but right before the pandemic, um, Jen Sukup, who you might know, yep. who's a casting person. So Jen asked me to come teach with her and I taught some classes there with her. And that was pretty cool because I hadn't been in that building in 25 years. <laughs> wow. And I was like, okay, I remember this. And, you know, got to, I, I taught some classes with her and we, we focused on ADR, which is, you know, recording to picture, um, yep. dialogue replacement, whatever. And, uh, and it was really great, you know? So, yeah. So before you even got to NYU, what was the, what, what even led you, what led you growing up to want to pursue at the very least a college degree in acting? Well, you know, I, um, when I was a, a, a younger kid, you know, there was a lot of imaginative play and stuff like that, but I was very academic, you know, I, I wanted to do physics and be Albert Einstein and go to Princeton and, and all that, um, and that was sort of my path for a little while. But then when I got a little bit older, you know, I started to get into uh, and music and then acting. And then suddenly I'm like, this is so much fun. And I don't need to do calculus or anything. Mm-hmm. You know? um, and and that part of me sort of took over. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. Like as a little kid, I would play games um with my friends you know where they were almost like it was like role-playing things where i'd be like okay i'm luke skywalker and and you're han solo and we would play star wars or you know i played dungeons and dragons uh through my life as as a a a kid up through high school and stuff and um all those things i really felt like lent themselves to to acting and, and just expanding your, you know, imagination and everything. And, and you know, there was this one thing. I got to find these because um, I know I have them. A friend of mine, his name was Jonathan Brownlee. John lives out west somewhere. And I, 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 I feel like he's probably very wealthy. He was very intelligent. And he he had a I, – I spoke to him once. He called me randomly. I had not talked to him since we were little kids. And like five years ago, I talked to him and – I know he he got into a lot of dot com stuff, and I think he did very well with it. But um, lucky, we, yeah, we uh, 
made up a radio station and we would make tapes like cassette tapes and record ourselves basically improving these radio shows and improving call in things with it, with people improving songs and the best were the commercials the commercials were the only things that we planned out and we would make up these commercials and generally you know like it, it, fart jokes were like yeah. kind of the you know so there were a lot of commercials for like beans and things like that or we would make fun of commercials that were on tv um so so I used to do that. And it was funny because I had thought about that for years. And then once I had got into doing this, I was like, I think coming doing a character for something and all of a sudden it came back to me. And I'm like, oh, you know, and I'm like, I, I could rip myself off then. And I'm, like, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to play this character like this guy that I made up when I was 12, you know? Yeah. So, so you know, I, I when I was in high school, I – I acted in a lot of plays and I did plays outside of my school and started auditioning for things. And I was good at it, you know? And at that point I was like, okay, I guess this is what I want to do. So I went to NYU to pursue acting and I, you know, uh, applied and auditioned to other places. I got accepted some other places, but I liked I liked New York and I, I liked New York very much when I was in high school, I would go and hang out there, you know, with friends and stuff like that. So that's where I decided to go to school and, you know, it, getting there, it, it's a tough transition. And, and you may have experienced this because there's the big fish, small pond thing. You know, I mm -hmm. was the star of all the stuff in high school, but then you get to the city and then, you know, you're nobody, nobody cares. Yeah. So, and that, I got to tell you, it was interesting because, see, it's funny now that I like taught at Stone Street and I actually taught a little thing at, at, at uh, NYFA, the New York Film Academy, like sure. last, last week, um, and that they're teaching voiceover classes, like as part of college. When I was at NYU, even at Stone Street, that wasn't a thing. Heck no. I, Not even when I, I was there. Yeah. And I'm retroactively really pissed off about that Yeah, because I'm like shit, had I known about this then? Yeah. I, I, I'm like, damn it, I would have cleaned up. No, that's not necessarily true, but I'm sure I would have auditioned for many things, and I'm sure I probably would have booked some stuff, but Heck still. Yeah. Um, you know, but nobody back then, and even when I really, like later when I really got into doing all the voiceover, the cartoon stuff and all that, none of the people who were working in that business it, none of us, it was not our goal to work in that business. We all mm -hmm. just kind of backed into it or ended up there. Sure. And at NYU, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm studying acting, but I started playing with bands. Um, and by the time I was like a junior, I'm like, let, you know, we just follow one good career decision after another. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be a rock star. <laughs> that will be my job. You know, <laughs> far more stable than actor. So smart, man. You should, <laughs> Einstein physics? Screw that. I'm going to try right? and be a rock star. Yeah, there's no future in that. Sure. Um, but, <laughs> but the, you know, I want, you know, because I was playing with bands and, and, and really loving it. And, um, you know, I kind of did my Dave Grohl thing back then. There was one band I played drums for and we were really heavy. We were like Tool, lots of odd time signatures and strange tunings and things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we had some degree of success back then. I mean, back then you had, to, if you wanted to, to make a CD and kids today won't even know what the hell that is. Mm -hmm. But when you made a CD, you had to go to like a facility, you know, sure. you had to go to like a factory so they could make you a CD. <laughs> um, but, and then, and then, you know, my other bands, I got out from behind the drums and I was singing and the singing one was like, the one, the band I played the drums for, we were, I think, a little more successful in terms of like getting like an indie label deal and getting a couple of records out. The stuff that I sang for, we gigged all the time, and uh -huh. that that was like my favorite thing ever was just playing music live, and it still is. Uh, I I think it is my favorite thing that I do, and I'm lucky that it, over the last couple of years i've been able to work that back into my life in a more mm. regular way 
but I really missed it. So, you know, so by the time I graduated, I, you know, diverted my energy towards music. So I graduated and I did everything I needed to do, but I missed some opportunities, I think, because I wasn't, you know, uh, a lot of what you get when you go to school at a place like NYU is you can make connections, you know, and you hustle and you meet people and you get out there. And I didn't really do that so much. I was trying to do that more with music stuff. Um, So I sort of missed an opportunity there. But, you know, I gave the band thing a shot. And when I graduated, like, that's what I did for a little while. Mm. And then we, you know, uh, you know, the, the one band broke up. We just couldn't get along with each other anymore. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. you know, Been there. Um, yeah. And, and the same thing, you know, when you're like 24 years old, well, well, the next band, will, you know, like as if the next thing will be the, exactly the same. Yeah, and it yeah. isn't. Nope. And with the bands I was singing with, like we had a like a spinal tap thing going on where we had this like revolving door of drummers. <laughs> that, like just we kept having to get rid of guys and replace them. And yeah, you know, but I ended up. After a while, you know, I'd been in studios a fair amount at that point, and I, I understood the technology of the day somewhat. Um, and uh, I ended up, you know, being at a place where I'm like, okay, I need a job. And I looked in the in the newspaper. Back in the day, we what got is our that? news from paper. I know. What, nothing what was dream is this? Yes, this if this was made of paper and. And in the New York Times. And uh, <laughs> there was a job for a DVD producer at a company called Central Park Media. Yes. <clears throat> Central Park Media. And this was this was 2000. So in March of 2000, I got hired by Central Park Media to be a DVD producer. And they were a distributor of anime. And in 2000, it was way different than it is now you know sure. um you know some of these companies were just like these companies that are huge either didn't exist or were just getting started it was a a, a niche of a niche you know i mean and and half of what i did was work on vhs tapes you know and then ovas probably right is what they things that uh, never aired. That, yeah, yeah, yeah never aired I mean, on uh television they go straight to vhs or dvd we were I guess doing vhs and dvd and i was uh, i was producing dvds but very quickly got sort of moved up and ended up producing all of their english language versions so i was producing all of their their dubs and uh i and then you know just like working for, and they weren't a big company, but just like working for any company, you know, every year they're like, we, we, we gotta, gotta cut the budget. We gotta maximize profits. So just, you know, how do we do that? So you learn yeah, this. Yeah, well, I, I took it upon myself actually to just be like, well, let's cut out the middleman. And instead of hiring out all these studios to do all this stuff, Let's rent the studios. I'll direct and I'll adapt the scripts and I'll hire my friend who's an engineer to engineer. I know all the actors now because we've been doing this for a little while and we'll just do it ourselves. <sighs> and they said, okay. And we started doing that. And then, you know, after doing that for a little while, I basically started to realize, okay, well, this company, it didn't really feel like they were growing. They were really starting to struggle. But I'm like, I think I can make a lot more. I could do much better from the other side. So I kind of transitioned and became like a vendor, you know? (laughs) So they, now I was, I made my own company and then they would send their stuff to me. And when this happened, I'd always, you know, so I'd been an actor and the people I, the actors I worked with and the other studios I worked with, they knew that I was an actor. Like that was my background. Mm. Um, so, but I never really did any of that. Yeah, I, I would do little parts in the shows that I directed. Sure. You know, but I didn't go out and audition for stuff because at the time, I think it, it would have been like a conflict of interest. And the, the, the powers that be at Central Park Media probably wouldn't have liked it if I had showed up in a Media Blasters show or somebody who was their competition, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as soon as I left there and went out on my own, immediately... I got a call from Four Kids, and Four Kids at the time was the biggest game in town, and they had the license to Pokemon, and they had Yu-Gi-Oh! and the Ninja Turtles, and all that stuff, and they were like, 
we want you to direct for us. I remember this was like the best interview ever. They're like, we want you to direct for us. It wasn't like, let's talk about this job. They're like, here's this job. And we're going to pay you twice as much money as you were getting before. I mean, they didn't know that, but that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, uh, you know, like trying to be cool and just be like, uh, I guess, you know, sure. What, you know. what, what made but, them think if you were doing the, the producing work, the vendoring work, what, what made them think like you're the guy to direct? Where did that skill set or their knowledge other, of that? The other people who worked for them said hire him. Like, you know, <laughs> so like. There were other guys who worked there um, and other guys in the business. I mean, you know, some people, a lot of them aren't, but some of them are. So, like, um, there was a guy named Eric Stewart uh, who sure. was their head director. I mean, unofficially, he was, you know, it wasn't like he was the boss of the directors, but he had kind of been there the longest. And I knew Eric uh, because I worked with him as an actor. And, and I think, you know, he so he knew me. There was a guy there. His name was Tony Salerno. Oh, and, good friend of mine. Oh, yes. Of yeah, course, yeah, yeah. right. You know Tony. So, you know, and Tony and I, we knew each other as well, and he recommended me. And I think also Mike Sitter Nicholas uh, put in a, a good From word NYAB for me back Post. then. Yep. Yes. So, like, you know, because I, I knew Mike just because we basically did the same stuff sure. back then. And, and they hired me. And at that point, I started getting auditions for stuff. And then I also was like reaching out to places that I had worked at previously or, or worked with or places like NYAV. And I'm like, Hey, you know, I, I'd love to audition for whatever you have, you know, and I had established relationships with the studios and the people who ran them. So it got me in the door. I mean, I wasn't like, you owe me, you know, <laughs> give me a part, but I'm like, let me audition. Yeah. And then I, then I started booking stuff and that was that. And, and, then, you know, I've been doing it ever since then pretty consistently. I mean, I've moved around and, you know, you work on this thing and then it's gone. And then, the, you know, and, and I've been lucky, too, because there have been times when, like, you know, show gets canceled. And then you're like, oh, man, I don't know what's going to happen. And then something pops up out of nowhere, you know. And and that's the other thing is is to... I never like sort of put my all my eggs in one basket. Yeah, you know, because even with Pokemon, when when that ended up going over to Do Art, and I was a little part of helping to get that over there, um, and the guy who was the producer on that, and so one of the main forces behind getting that over there is Tim Morenko, who is my business partner at Three Beep now. Like Tim and I started working together at Central Park Media, mm. so we worked together for like twenty one, twenty two years, something like that. So. You know, uh, Pokemon was great and it was this big contract, but we needed, we're like, we got to get other stuff. So yeah. then we went out and hustled and got all these other clients and made all these other contacts and started working, you know, with companies from all over the world. And then when we left Duart to form our own thing, so it was me, Tim, and uh, Charles Darby, who was the COO of Duart, and the three mm -hmm. of us uh, are doing 3Beep. You know, we basically, except for Pokemon, took all the other clients with us. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's that. I mean, it it's funny, you know, how you where you end up. It's not what I had planned for. I, in some ways, it's what I trained for. I mean, I had the education in in acting, which comes in handy as an actor, obviously, but even mm -hmm. as a director in a big way. Um, and then because of all the music stuff that I did. I got to know recording technology and studio stuff, and that ended up benefiting me, you know? It's kind of like the perfect so, yeah. storm of the new, like, uh, back in the day, let's say, people always used to call people triple threats actors. If yeah. You could, yeah. If you could act, if you could sing, and if you could dance. Uh -huh. And I feel like now you got to be like a quintuple threat to even have a, 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 yeah. a, a make a living wage as a, as a performer. Yeah. But it sounds like for you, it was the kind of the perfect storm of understanding the, the audio technology, understanding the musicality of what goes into being yeah. a voiceover artist or director. And then obviously having the chops to act, which I'm assuming is, which, which is where my question is going to lead in a second, but also mm -hmm. just, and having the, the, the communication skills to, to network with these people and make relationships yeah. that are going to eventually lead to all these jobs. But so where did, uh, first, first day on the job directing, whatever that first job is, did you feel like you had the skill set to kind of work with actors? How did you know how to direct? Did you, were you doing like short films or was it just like trial by fire? 
Um, I know what I think sounds good as an actor, and that's how I'm going to direct these things to sound. You know, I I mean, I directed a little bit like in when I was a senior in high school, I directed the fall uh, play because mm-hmm. they they I remember the um, the uh, uh, the the guy who you know ran the theater department, mm-hmm. Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry. He was like the art teacher, Mr. Terry. Like I feel they're the always called department. Mr. Terry. Yeah, and he and he asked, you know, he was like. And the, the sh- I remember the show too. It was this is this god awful thing? It was called Moose Murders, and Moose Murders is one of these like kind of Broadway legend things, like you know, like Carrie the Musical that sure. like opened and closed on the same weekend. In <laughs> and this is I think it was from the seventies, and it was just a really silly comedy that was also kind of a murder mystery. And I remember when the time came then. You know, he was trying to figure out what to do for the fall show. The spring show is a musical. So the fall show would be a drama or a comedy or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it had come down to two things. One of them was Amadeus. And the other one was this Moose Murders thing. And I wanted it to be Amadeus so bad. <laughs> and me me and the only other person who went on to to pursue acting, you know, in college and stuff, we were the only two people that wanted Amadeus. And, and I wanted to be Mozart, and he wanted to be Salieri, and that would have been awesome. But every other kid was like, ha ha, Moose Murders looks... I'm like, oh. Let's kill a moose! Let's do it live! And, and, and I was, you know, and I think he felt bad, and he was just like, well, look, I can give you this part in this show, or maybe you want to direct it. And I was like, yes, I'll direct it. So, so, so that way I could like just take out all my frustrations on all these other actor kids who voted for the wrong damn show. <laughs> um, so that was like my first real thing, like really directing a, a full cast. And, <clears throat> you know, at NYU, uh, in my acting education, I got into a little bit of that. Yeah. You know, like there were sometimes it was a project where it's like you directed this scene with these two other students, you know, sure. and they would direct you and, um, and one of my intern things, uh, I worked at the Cocteau Rep Theater, which was on uh, Bowery and Bond Street. I don't think they're there anymore. They were, they did great work. And I worked, I was like, sort of like the assistant director on Hamlet. Uh, mm. So this woman was, you know, was directing Hamlet and then she had, I, and honestly, I, 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 I don't remember her name. It was a long time ago, um, but she was fantastic. And she had, I think, from what I understand, had quite a pedigree. And I was like her sidekick. And uh-huh. and just that was worth a lot, being able to sit there with her and watch and listen. And, you know, and then when I was producing shows, before I started directing them, uh, uh, producing animation stuff, you know, I would I I I didn't go sit in on all the sessions because part of it is like why am i hiring you if i have to sit here and hold your hand you know what i mean i'll I'll check in with you um and you know i watched the process and i understood it and i'm like okay this makes sense to me so the first time i did it i felt ready you know i i feel like you know i definitely you you i over explained early on Mm -hmm. you know um I, I was careful to not like, you know, try not to like line read people and stuff. Sure, sure. But I felt like I just over explained a little too much. And and now I, you know, and, and since like I try to do a little less, like, you know, when it, when it's a new show or a thing, you know, whatever, everybody's got to sort of learn what's going on. But when you get into doing a series, like you and I worked on a series. A plenty. And I, you know. And I know once once we're a certain way, a uh, part of the way into it, I don't need to un- explain to you how your character thinks. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? And I just said, well, this is what's going on. And then I let you react to it the way your character is going to react to it because you know that. And then, you know, it's, it's your trust in your actors. And then if, if I feel like you're off a little bit, I'll be, well, you know, let's maybe give it a little more of this or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, because directing, especially when it's ADR, when you're matching picture – it's a weird micromanagey kind of direction because you go one line at a time. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine rehearsing a play where they no. direct every line? You know? <laughs> well, and yeah. just to, to, to a couple of things here, and 
my kind of first foray into, I mean, I've, I'd done dubbing and voiceover. I was doing a lot of promo and radio stuff, but my real kind of first, like, heavy experience doing animation and all that stuff was working with you. And one of the things I've appreciated with you to this day, even since working on all the stuff that I've worked on, even with big studios, smaller studios, is that you understand the material. So, so oftentimes in voiceover, things are moving so fast yeah. that the director or nobody really even knows what's going on. But a lot of times when I work with you, you might consider it over explaining, but I think it's a nice brief of, okay, this is the project you're working on. This is the <laughs> things that happen. Where yeah. This is the scene you just came from. A lot of times yeah. I feel like a lot of shows or games, they, they get away with people who are really great indicators or they're good actors enough to be able to play a line to sound good, but it doesn't yeah. necessarily create for compelling story or, or for like yeah. a consistent story. And I, that's one of the things I always cherished working with you is like i know Thanks, i'm gonna man. get i'm gonna get the information i need to like do my yeah. job comfortably yeah uh, i mean and that's what it comes down to it's like you know because i've seen i'd seen some guys over the years like just over direct and i'm like if the actor needs help help them but otherwise don't get in their way yeah you know and and a lot of that also comes down to casting and i feel like that I, I think I've got a knack for it. And I also feel like that I've been very lucky. I mean, that, you know, I've had all these great actors at my disposal and I think I've done a good job of picking the right people for the right parts. And like, you know, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, you got to take a guess, but it works out. Like we, uh, we did that feature recently and the kid, yeah. the teenage kid who was working with you. Yes. I was like, I didn't know what to expect. That kid was awesome. Yes. And he was so natural. And I and I was just because I was a little worried. And especially like talking to to Dom, Dominic Dunn, who is uh, my more or less my my Robin to my Batman, you know, <laughs> with this sort of thing. Shout uh, out to Dominic. Great guy. Yeah. And Dom, uh, you know, was in the studio with him and he would tell me like how the kid would prepare and and how, you know, he would ask questions and how he kind of like physically like you know he was really taking it seriously i'm like that's great you know i was yeah. so happy um yeah so anyway so let's yeah. talk into that a little bit so mm -hmm. number one i mean there's a whole conversation to be had about finding people and the casting process and how yeah. your experience with that is but let's talk about first your experience with directing people and mm -hmm. i think it comes up a lot in kids what are the things you think that makes an actor stand out so whether this is someone you've worked with a lot of the times or this is somebody new that's getting into the industry what are the things that stand out the most that says to you like this person is is the, the not only ripe for the job but i know that i can trust them with this yeah. uh this piece of material i uh, you know there i mean there are some simple basic things like you know show up on time <laughs> that kind of stuff um you know but like um People who ask questions, uh, that's usually a good sign if somebody admits to not knowing a thing. Because if there's something in the script and the actor doesn't know what it is and they don't ask me and just plow ahead and I'm, and I'm like, no, I'm like, you don't know. I'm like, you know, you just ask, you know, I'm like, and, and it's, oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm like, I'll try to get out in front of those things sometimes yeah. and be like, Hey, do you know what this is or whatever? But you know, um, I, I remember one actor I worked with who was fantastic. Um, and I, I hope that he's still around. And yeah. by that, I mean, alive, <laughs> um, uh, COVID had to be tough on this guy, but his name was Bill Toast and Bill Toast, uh, would, if, if he's around now, he's 85 86 um the last time i worked with him was i'd say maybe about two and a half years ago two and a half to three years ago and he was um he was a theater actor he uh big in gilbert and sullivan stuff and he was in the fantastics off broadway one of the longest ran, you know, running off broadway shows of all time it ran Still for running, like I think, right? 41 years or something from like 1960 to 2001 before it closed and yeah. then you know reopened oh, yeah, he yeah. was in it for something like 23 of those years wow and he played all the male parts yeah. uh at, over the course of it and that guy if you ever did a movie with him he would just like he he asked the most questions and it's like you might get exasperated except every question he asked was a really good question you know mm. and i'm like 
Oh, okay. That's Oh, all right. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. And it was great, especially when he was part of group records. Yeah. Because then everyone else would just be like, Oh, uh uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, like listening to what he was asking. And, but, um, so like, that's often a good sign. I mean, you know, uh, you know, people uh, like, we don't work with people in person as much as we used to. We still do, but not all the time because since things have gone remote, but you know, I mean, the, the worst thing ever was like, you know, when you worked with actors and they're like in the, let's just imagine this is smaller and it's a phone and they're in the booth, like doing their oh, yeah. deliver a line, you know, I'm like, that drives me nuts. Okay. Yeah. Put it away. Put it away. Put your phone uh, away. You know, not only in school, but also at work. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> and it's like, you know, just, just let me know that you're, you're paying attention to me because here's the thing. Like we're, we're a team. We're working together. You yeah. know what I mean? I'm going to tell you a thing and, and you're going to do it and you're going to do this and I'm going to respond. You know, so, I mean, very often, you know, I mean, people need to be, they need to be relaxed. It's nice if you can have fun. I mean, you know, it, again, it's, it's not every show is fun. Sometimes they're a grind, but, you know, and just people, I, I, it, it's nice when people can sort of appreciate, like, <laughs> you know, what we do. Yeah. Like, we're lucky, man. We really are. And, I, you know, not that we don't have problems, yeah. but, like... You know, every now and then, you know, I, I remember like, you know, working on stuff like Pokemon and you'd have an actor in there who would kind of have this weird like, oh, I went to Juilliard attitude and now I'm voicing a monkey. And I'm like, then Fun. don't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm like, then don't do this. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I don't care. I'll get 10 other monkeys in 10 minutes, man. I'm like, you know, just, yeah, it's, you know, you gotta, there's, it's just this degree of professionalism. I mean, it's, it's hard to know sometimes, you know, if somebody's going to be good or not. Listening to auditions, obviously, it helps. Um, I look at people's resumes. We, me and people who like, who do what I do, we will talk to each other. Um, you know, where uh, like Darren Dunstan, I, I don't know if you know Darren, Mm-mm. who Darren Dunstan directs Yu-Gi-Oh! He also directs a lot of stuff for um, Nickelodeon. Sure. And Darren is someone I worked with at 4Kids. And Darren uh, teaches at Actors Connection, and Darren will send people to me. And if and if Darren recommends a person, that person has something going for him. Sure. And I will do the same thing with actors. I'll be like, you should you should reach out to this guy or or you know hit up this girl. And the the number one way that I get good talent is through other actors. Mm-hmm. You know because like you know Paul, I work with you. I respect you. You know what the hell you're doing. And also, you know, you, you, you do, you know, you've directed, you've written, you've, you've created stuff. And if you come to me and say, Hey, this actor is, I just worked with them on this project and they're really good. That endorsement means something. Cause I yeah. know you're not going to bullshit me. And you also, you know, I don't want to put my reputation what, on the line either. You, well, you, and you know what good talent sounds like. That, you know yeah. That saying? more importantly. So, or, <laughs> and, and that's, and that's the thing. So like, you know, I I find a lot uh, come from recommendations from people that I work with, yeah. which then also just shows to the young actors out there it behooves you to you know to get out there and get involved in things. Yeah, and I don't the... mean just chat rooms. I mean like go be in a play or yeah. take a class or whatever. You know, things like that. I think that's a big question that a lot of people have is like, I'm an actor. How do I, how do I network with the big, these big people? It's like, it's like network with the people around you. I mean, every, there's so many pieces of work, including working with you that I got from working with the people around me. We were working on, and I think it's pretty safe to say, cause it is as soon as it came out it, is as soon as it came off, we worked on a Johnny test iteration of some sort together and that's what we so that's how we met i was doing a a johnny test and you were playing my dog dookie and and that's not also to to say i learned so much from you in that session like i said i was doing a lot of things but in that session i remember i remember looking at you and Lori and being like thank god i have these two people to like look off (laughs) of because we and the the interesting thing about this and this is a very real scenario maybe uncommon though because i have not experienced this we recorded like 
24 episodes in one day in like four hours i feel like we recorded like an entire se- series season yeah. prelay which means we're all in the same room in one day in yeah. one hour which is like yeah we yeah we it was i i can't even i i remember that day I, it was a long day mm-hmm. and yeah and we and the three of us played everybody yes yes you yes. Know? which was nuts and i you know i i, I know you know that we all have experience and uh, a range. You know, playing different characters. But I just, could, I'm like, are are you sure? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, because I remember getting cast as Dookie and as Johnny's dad. Yeah, and but then they're just like, yeah, you're basically going to play everybody else. And then at some point they're like, well, Paul, here you be this guy and this guy, and then Tom, you be this guy and this guy and this guy. And yeah. any female was Lori. Yeah. <laughs> any every single one. I'm like okay, you know, but you gotta and- be prepared for that. And and honestly, that's where I learned because I mean, I got I got off the hook a lot of the times because I was yeah. playing Johnny, and I was usually they didn't want me to be sure, playing yeah. the other guys. But just watching you and Lori be able to kind of play that utility role, which is kind of the term for somebody who can just fill in at any moment in time. Yeah. As an actor, to see you do that, I'm I'm not even kidding you. And obviously, yeah. having worked together on the other projects we do, um, I learned so much at what it takes to to to. to in the moment, see a picture or not even a picture, hear a description and be like, yeah. okay, make that voice right now. Like yeah. f- figure, figure it out. You have to have yeah. the skill set or the knowledge or yeah. the experience to be able to do that. And I learned a lot of that from, from you and Lori and I've gotten better at it myself, but I think you're one of the, the good um, utility players in that oh, way. Nice. Obviously, uh, I think- hey, Listen, man, that is, I have made most of my, my animation voiceover work is by being, I'm the utility infielder of, of that world, you know? Yeah. I've played leads and I've played bad guys, you know, but way more often than not, I'm just picking up all these other bits. Yeah. And I'm happy to do it, you know? <laughs> that work pays too. And, yeah. you know, it, it, and it really, you know, because that was like with Pokemon. I played all these creatures and stuff and, you know, I, when when uh, One Piece was at four kids, uh, that show was nuts because every episode had sixty five different characters in it, and sixty of them are dudes because all these pirate crews. And we go in there, and they'd be like, "How many of these guys can you be?" And I'm like, "I don't know. Let's just keep going until you think <laughs> I can." Out. And then, you know, and then we just I just keep doing stuff. Until so, they're like, you played yeah. that character already. We we need another voice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, that's, you know, how we would do it. And, you know, and it's funny. And, like, my my guy who's my, you know, just one of my favorite actors I ever worked with is Mark Thompson. Mm. Um, and Mark, of course, you know, books leads in lots of stuff because he's amazing. But Mark can also do every voice there is. Yeah. So, like, he's the best where, like, I'm like, oh, there's all these ancillary bits. And then, I'm, oh, wait, Mark's in the show. It's fine. You know, and, yeah. uh, you know, I, I remember the first time I noticed that is uh, I was in G.I. Joe Sigma 6, uh, which was the G.I. Joe from the 2000s, like yeah, 2005, 6, 7, something like that. Yeah. And I was Storm Shadow. I was the Cobra Ninja, probably the last white guy to play him, you know, <laughs> um, before all that changed and changed for the good. Rightfully you know? so. Um, but, but back then, you know, I played him, didn't give him an accent or anything like that, but just, he was sort of intense and whatever. Yeah. And I remember we're having a scene at Cobra High Command and, you know, there's, you know, Storm Shadow standing there and there's Cobra Commander and he's talking and then there's Destro who like has this deep voice and, you know, yeah. whatever. And then there's Zartan who's all Australian and everything. And I'm like listening because i was the last person in the scene so these guys were done and i'm like oh i'm like well, who's that cobra commander i was like oh that, that voice sounds great who's that oh that's mark thompson okay oh who's playing destro he sounds cool it's not like a big black dude oh it's mark thompson oh okay so who's zartan that's mark i'm like what and i'm like <laughs> who is uh, where is he i need to meet him i need to see yeah. him. and and after that i was just like and then i'm like i started using him for stuff because i didn't really know mark before then and yeah. since then, I mean, God, he's fantastic. And he narrates, he's the main male narrator for the Star Wars audiobooks. Mm, fantastic uh, where he really, audiobooks. Yeah. And he shows off his range there. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, listen, here's another, just a tidbit for the young actors. We talk about up. all this stuff with the range and all this. Having great vocal range is, 
is a nice trick. It's a nice thing to have in your back pocket. But if you're not a good actor, it doesn't mean shit. <laughs> it so don't mean poop. What you need, you know, to focus on is being an actor because, like, the example I would use for people is, like, James Earl Jones, okay? Mm -hmm. That guy sounds like James Earl Jones all the time. Like, he's yeah. got one sound, okay? It's Darth Vader. It's Simba. That's his sound. But yeah. as an actor, he can play somebody despicable and evil. He can play somebody heroic. He can play comedy. He can, you know, he, because he is a, a very talented actor. Yeah. But he doesn't have this massive vocal range. But the fact that he's a good actor means we all know who he is. You know? mm -hmm. and, and that's the most important thing. If you can be Mark and do all these different voices and to be a great actor, awesome. And, yeah. you know, I want to meet you. But uh, just you got to focus on the actor part first. You know, I think so many people get lost in that idea of, especially in the world of Im Im impersonations that are so heavy and on TikTok, whatever it is, everyone wants to make a living trying to sound like every other person. But the the biggest thing that's going to book you the roles is you. And if you're yeah. a good actor, it's yep. you know start there, and then yeah, you can and, develop other characters. Yeah, and that's like with people doing their demos and things like that. Because I I produce demos with people. Um, Erica Schroeder. I don't know if you know Erica. Mm -hmm. Erica Schroeder, um, she is a voiceover coach and teacher. And she's an actor I've worked with for a long time. Fantastic. But I produce demos with her. And the one thing that we always make sure is, and if possible, the first thing that you hear is that actor's natural voice, you know? Yeah. And, and somewhere on there just being able to be themselves because that is the one thing that you can do better than every other person in the world, guaranteed. Yep. is be you okay so 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 you gotta yeah you, you gotta That's put the, that out there please if anybody <laughs> listening watching whatever it is learn if that is the best piece of advice you can honestly learn in the world of, of of voiceover and yeah circling back to kind of our earlier conversation there's no real aside from going to like outside classes like people want to go to college and get degrees um there's no real like degree in voice actor there's no college degree in no. uh, in voice acting uh even voice director quite frankly or even oh, specifically yeah, no. what people even want it like most people who are fans of anime and cartoons and video games they often want to like become uh voice actors that's often mm -hmm. where that trajectory i think comes from and it's not like i'm a fan of acting and being an actor yeah i think people have to understand and fall in love with the craft of acting and, and that yeah. whole thing before they can get to these other things yeah. of, of of vo yeah and that's the thing is the voice actors are actors or they need to be actors first yes. and foremost and you use your voice but, you know, also the other thing is, you know, and this is the thing I was telling the people at the NYFA, the, the New York Film Academy. I'm like, yeah, your goal here is not to learn to be an actor. It's to learn to be a working actor. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I mean, you, you're an actor now. OK, but like, you know, you, you want to and, you know, part of doing that is. You want to I mean, listen, once you get rich and famous and you can just pick and choose whatever projects you want, fine. But yeah. up until then, don't you don't turn your nose up at anything. You know, you know, I, I work with, you know, because in New York City, I work with tons of Broadway actors. And it's not like, well, I've made it to Broadway. This is I'm done. You know, no way. They're still doing some of this and some of that and some of this, some of it because they enjoy it and it's fun. A lot of it because it's money and this is their job. It's how they pay yeah. their bills. And also because, you know, in most acting gigs, you know, nothing lasts forever. You're on Broadway. You have a contract for six months, a year. If you're in the ensemble, maybe you can get a long running contract. But even so, you know, it, it, it's don't pigeonhole yourself. And especially because anime voice acting is the thing that's sort of in the news the most now. But, yeah. you know, if your goal is to just voice act on anime – you're going to have a real hard time making a living. And, oh yeah. You know, ju and just because even if, you know, if people can get what they, Oh, it's now it's a union job, whatever you still, you know, it, there's still not this endless amount of it. And yeah, when yeah. you work, it's not this endless amount of work. And yeah. there is no scenario ever that is going to allow all those actors. Well, I worked for one hour this week. So I'm set for the month, you know, no, it's, yeah, not, know. it's never going to be that. 
No. You know, so you got to you got to do as much as you can. And honestly, man, I mean, I don't necessarily have a bias against people who have like theater on their resume, but it's nice to see that people mm-hmm. have a variety of other acting jobs because I see that and I say, oh, this person wants to be an actor and they're doing mm-hmm. this, they're doing that, whatever. Also, with a lot of the broad, um, you know, the broad goofy comedy stuff uh, that that we do, uh, musical theater people, they know how to play to the back row. You know what I mean? Yeah. And sometimes that helps. Um, you know, sometimes people who are film actors, you know, the c- camera will zoom in, they'll move the boom in. And they can give these like tiny little performances that sometimes don't, you know, translate with the voiceover. Depending sometimes on what the job is. Yeah. You know, well, like when you do video games, it's a more film style sometimes. Yeah. But then there's stuff. I mean, and especially like your your wackier anime things or stuff like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, which are big, you know, and you got to be able to go big. Yes. And I mean, it's a style. I remember meeting this kid who was a star of one of those Disney Channel live action shows. You know, we're like, everybody's super happy all the time. And yeah. he was a really nice dude. But I remember him telling me, he's like, you know, people just don't give us credit. They think what we do is just cheese. He's like, look, it's a style. And he's like, do you know how hard it is to have that level of energy on every oh. single take? And Mm -hmm. like listening to that, it's like, God damn, you're not kidding, man. You are a professional. What you do is hard. And the thing is, you know, is that how you do Macbeth? No, but it's how you do the thing that you're doing, you know? Yeah. And I mean, hats off to that guy. And it was just really, it was really interesting to hear him say that, you know, and to have this discussion with it because he's like, this is acting. It's just a different style, you know? And yeah. You know, and that's the thing is also, you know, you got to know, you know, what are you working on? Because there were guys who worked on four kids stuff and a lot of the four kids style, as you may be aware, was really fast and really loud. Yeah. And, you know, (laughs) four kids. (laughs) Yeah. And then if you try to do one of these G kids movies that like NYAV is doing and you're like, you know, hey, everybody, you know, and then suddenly they're like, all right, see you later. You know, you got to be able to turn it off. And, you know, so that's why it's nice to see on somebody's resume a, a, a range of acting work, but yeah. also why it's good to pursue that. So you remember, and, and it's just more experience for you. Every, you know, every job you get, hopefully you're going to learn something from mm-hmm. and, and, and you're going to become a better actor. I mean, you know, and that was very nice of you to say that, you know, from doing the Johnny test job, it's like you learned something and who knew, right. You know, and yeah. then, you know, so that's, you know, and that's the other thing. I mean, you know, getting the education, helps it definitely matters you don't have to go to college for four years to succeed at it but if you have the means it doesn't hurt and getting education practice etc is good and a lot of that you know if you can learn by doing it helps because you know even when you're on the job you could you could still be learning so and i think that's a big thing to know is that if you are given the the tremendous pleasure which you've given me many times to do prelay and work with other actors at the same time is to freaking pay attention to these people around you who are more than likely been doing it longer than you are better than you at it take the things that work for you and you know like i'm always keeping my like ear to the floor like i'm like trying to pick up on any sort of trick or whatever i can and and like you're saying immerse yourself in every form of of training well you you worked with uh uh, bill timoney on that uh, movie back in the day, right? Yeah, well, Bill Timoney, good friend of mine, and he was one of the first, I think, uh, my story, quickly, I got into voice acting very backwards because I had always an interest in anime, video games, animation before I started acting, and I got very firmly told, you're not going to become... You got to become an actor first was the the way it boiled down. But you want to do voice acting, you got to learn how to act first. And I say that to everybody. And then my theater uh, head of theater director at the time, Jack Burke, he hooked me up with Bill Timoney, who was doing, uh, you know, Pokemon and tons of anime at the time and uh, uh, Walla for a bunch of things and and even everything. He was working on everything. And and I started working as an associate producer on things. And so I just was putting myself in every, he was doing a short film with Anthony Salerno. I started yep. doing associate producing with him. He was working with Fatih over in, uh, 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 in Jersey at, uh, yeah. the yeah, Turkish that's, dubbing I, I studio. Brought, I brought him in there just so you know, oh my I, I got that studio off the ground. 
Hey, voice actors, just wanted to take a quick second from this episode to let you know about an amazing opportunity we have for Points of Experience listeners. We've teamed up with Voice123.com to get you all 15% off their premium membership starting with the $3.95 tier. Now, they also offer a free membership where you can check it out and see what they're about. But with the paid memberships, you're going to get access to more auditions. You're going to get your auditions faster. You're going to get better support. You can upload more samples. All of that is going to be available with the paid memberships. I've used it before in my career, and I've curated my own client list that I've still worked with today. I started making money. It's also a great opportunity for you to take a portfolio of this paid work and present it to agents or managers and say, hey, look, I'm professional, I'm bookable, I've made money doing this, and here are the jobs that I did it on in TV, radio, commercial, video games, animation. They have it all at Voice123. So go to voice123.com slash plans slash POX, and you're going to get 15% off their paid memberships if you are a first-time premium package buyer or looking to upgrade into a higher tier that you've never purchased before. I promise you it's a great place to start working. So check it out and start booking today. To jump back in really quickly, sure. yes, Bill Timoney, good friend of mine. I started working with Fati. You were saying about Fati. I, I, I got that, that whole program started like in... Uh, I remember, uh, this was, this was one of these weird, like kind of random strokes of luck where it was like the show that I was doing at four kids, we were days away from starting the new season and they canceled it. Uh huh. And I was like, you know, I got this raise, you know, I, and, and I think this was going to be a good year. And, and it, they're like, whoop, gone. Sorry, Tom, we got no work for you. Ugh. And then being like, son of a bitch. And I remember it was the day before Thanksgiving. I'm like, you bastard. So, and, <laughs> and, and just pulled the rug right out from under me. And they were like, yeah, no, nah, nothing. And, yeah. and that was, you know, they were sort of starting their slow decline then, but whatever. And I didn't know what the hell to do. And the next day I saw this thing about what turned into uh, Everest production. Everest, that's Ever, the name Ever of Ever it. Everest TV. Yeah. <laughs> about how they're looking for somebody for this dubbing stuff. So I went down there, met with them and they had not done anything yet. So then I, they hired me to, I basically set up that whole and like more or less was just showed them how to do it. You know? Oh my God. And, and this is Fat, Fati wasn't there yet. Like he showed up like six months later, uh -huh. but that's where I really got to know Bill. Um, because like I had met Bill before, like doing some anime stuff. But Bill had gone to L.A. And, you know, back then, if the people weren't right in front of you, you never worked with them. So, you know, um, <clears throat> but that's where I really got to know Bill. Um, and he started working on that stuff. And then we became really good friends. And yeah, and that, you know, uh, but yeah, so like I know all those guys from back then for from, you know, and that was like and that saved my ass because the four kids stuff went away. I didn't know what I was going to do. That showed up. And that was my sort of little bridge to ending up working at do art uh, with Pokemon because, you know, once I was moving out of the Turkish stuff, I started, you know, I went right into working on Pokemon and yeah, you know, yeah, it was crazy. But, uh, but you know, Bill, I, I, I've learned a lot from Bill because he's a guy who's been in every aspect of this business. And I mean, yeah. of the acting business, not just voiceover stuff and, you know, having, you know, and, and that's a, a guy right there who you look at, you know, he's he's done theater, he's done TV, he does all these things, and he's still, you know, plugging away, you know, yeah. because, uh, you know, Bill is, is, is an interesting case because, you know, like, some people think of actors as being like, either someone who's famous on TV, or on a movie screen, or people who are like, you know, working in a restaurant, you know, whatever. Yeah. But Bill is this guy who has quietly worked on this mountain of amazing shit and made yep. a career out of this for, you know, 40 years or more, you know. A true um, journeyman actor, as they would say. Yeah, definitely. And that guy has got some good stories. Uh, yeah. You know. We're so, going to have and, Bill and, on the show. We're going to have Bill if, on the show. Uh, if, if you do... Uh, you got to make him tell you the story about the Irishman, about working on the Irishman. Oh, I, I okay. saw that play. That was one of the. Uh, that oh, was... no, no, not the play. The 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 movie with Robert De Niro. 
Oh, 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 oh. His, he should do a tour of college acting classes telling this story. I'm not going to tell it because he's got to tell it. All right. Me, but I'm Keith, telling make you, a note of that. I, I, when Bill told me that story, I'm like, I've heard you tell a lot of stories that this was the best one. And it was something that's not just like, oh, wow, that's a great story. That's funny. It's like, it is a lesson that every, every kid who's an acting student should hear. Oh you gosh, know? I'm, and, I'm, I'm excited. It's, just, it's a, it's preparedness and, and it is, it is like, yeah, it, it's amazing. So if, if you get him on the show, make sure he tells that story. Absolutely. So, that, that we, yeah. we, We've got that pin. I, I just want to ask you two more questions here. Sure. Make sure I cover these things. And then we have a question from some of our, our audience that we want to uh, ask you quickly to end the show. But okay. uh, I quickly want to talk about um, just a little bit more about like what you do in terms of uh, directing and, and with 3 Beep. And if somebody was interested in pursuing a career as a voice director today. Obviously, for you, it was kind of, you fell into it, I guess, in a way. It was yeah. a backwards way of getting there. What would be kind of like your recommendations for somebody today interested in pursuing like voice direction? Well, you know, if you want to get into, you know, again, voice direction, it is different. Uh, more, It's more different, you know, like with acting and voice acting. Voice direction is a little more different than maybe if you're directing a film or a play. Mm -hmm. But, um uh, you know, the, the more that you can learn and observe someone who actually does this. So if, if there's any opportunity to intern anywhere, uh, you should try that. I know some of the bigger studios might do that, but then you, you'd need to be in those places. So place some places in LA or like, you know, maybe, you know, Funimation, Crunchyroll, whatever down in Texas. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, if you, you know, have experience, like if you direct theater, you know what I'm saying? It's like that helps, you know, um, just being able to understand how to communicate with actors to get your point across, but not stifle the creativity that they're trying to bring. You know what mm. I mean? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think that's uh, it's so important to, to be. And working hands on with actors, I think, is is, is invaluable. I had yeah. the, the pleasure of when I was in New York, I would go work with the Columbia students on their short films, oh, and they cool. would have the directing the actor scenes where you'd go in and work with these directors as an actor. And I learned so much on how to direct by working with these other directors and seeing what they were doing, which was oftentimes wrong. Yeah. You know, doing line readings or just basically yeah. instruct, like, you know, mechanically instructing the scene, which is often not conducive to a good uh, product. Yeah. And uh, so the, the last thing too is kind of in this age that we're in uh, where this is being recorded in April of 2022 for anybody who is curious listening to this in the distant, distant future. We are at what appears to be the end of a pandemic, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> where of. do you believe, where do you believe um, uh, home recording is going to exist specifically for you and for, for actors in the future, do you think it's, it's a viable thing? Do you think it's important for people to have their own home studio? Uh, um, yeah, it is. It like, you know, um, there are going to be some productions that the studios are going to make a degree of a comeback. Okay. So especially when it comes to group records and, and things like that, um, you know, the in-studio stuff is, is going to, that's going to come back, not exclusively, but it's going to come back. But then there's other people who have been able to cut massive overhead by not having so much rentable studio space, by not mm. having to carry the, the financial burden of all of that. Um, it, three B, you know, definitely, you know, falls under that heading. I mean, we have a studio in Manhattan, but we don't need as much space as we did once before because so mm. many of the actors can work from home there, you know. So, yes, it is. It behooves you to understand, you know, uh, uh, you know, kind of the home recording capability, or at least having a good, uh, a really solid home studio, so people can record you remotely. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there is a bit of a, you know, it, again, it, it it doesn't mean that you know when you have the home studio that doesn't automatically like make you uh, an actor. You know, yeah. <laughs> you still got you still got to learn how to act. You still got. But I be bought actor. all these things. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> so great. Uh, why don't we kick this over to our question here, uh, 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 Tom? You've been so helpful. I think people are going to really get a, 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 a lot of knowledge here. I'm sure somebody has a great question for you that uh, we can we can cap this off with here, Keith. Why don't we uh, bring that up here? What do we get? What do we got for Tom? 
so we have a question from Darren H. The question is, what is your recommendation for sending in auditions? I've heard you should send in one good take, but I've also heard you should send in two or three. If more than one, what should be different between each take? Okay, so the, the most important thing to know is um, read the, the specs for the audition. And if they tell you to submit one take, submit one take. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I generally tell people <clears throat> is um, one take is fine, but if you're going to do two, they must be distinctly different from each other and submit them as separate files. Uh, you may think that your performances are like these teeny tiny little nuances. You know, I'm going to do five takes of this and each one is like 1% more sad or whatever. Don't do two takes unless they're very noticeably different. Okay. This one is American. This one has a French accent. That's mm -hmm. different, you know? So, um, I remember somebody telling me once, um, I think it was Michael Sinter Nicholas. Actually, he's like, very often your first shot at it is usually your best one. Cause it's your most <laughs> honest. You're not yeah. overthinking it. You just do it. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, you don't want to belabor it and you don't want to overthink it because you will squeeze the life out of it. You know, yeah. um, to some degree, your instinct is, you know, will often guide you. Cause the other thing is also, you don't necessarily have to, it doesn't necessarily need to be the exact perfect thing that that director, uh, maybe had in their mind, but you just have to show them that you can act. I can create a character and perform this scene and make it feel real or funny or whatever the, you know, the scene is about. Yeah. But just more than anything, you know, in terms of number of takes, fewer takes are better. Be focused. If you throw five takes at me, you don't know what this character is. You're throwing darts yeah. at a board. Okay. Um, so fewer takes are better. And if you do two takes or whatever, make sure they're very different, but above all, do what they're asking for. So if they ask for one, do not deliver two. Hmm. So. perfectly said and i always say to that same note you don't want to be doing your homework while you got the record button hit because not only is it going to be a nightmare for you to edit and figure out like what that 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 audition is going to be but it's also like we don't want to see that minuscule nuance of you up inflecting on one line versus what you were you know like it's it's just not worth yeah. wasting somebody's time on that because uh, casting directors will take note of that and you don't want to be the person to be like they really wasted my five minutes of my time on absolutely no difference. <laughs> yeah, right. They're not going to call you back for that. Um, very, very, very well said. I think people are going to learn a ton of this. Thank you so much, Tom, the invaluable knowledge that you have, not only as an actor, but as a voice director and all around creator performer. Um, there's so much more I could have asked you, but I value your time uh, <laughs> Thanks, so man. much. Uh Honestly, uh, I can't wait to have uh, uh, Bill on, and we can we yeah. can hear the Irishman's story. Thanks to your insight on that, yeah. and um, Tom, it's always it's always a pleasure. I look forward to the next thing we work on. Yeah, me too. Tom Wayland, everybody, what a uh, sensational, nice guy. I mean, everything I said couldn't have been more true uh, in terms of working with him and him being such a generous person to me and and kind to me uh as an actor and um he's he's definitely he knows his stuff and it's a tough tough industry uh specifically dubbing these foreign titles and when he started you know anime and like pokemon these were things these were like brand new things i mean very small amount of uh animation in the late 90s early 2000s were like considered mainstream so every single thing was a risk and and if you go look into the history of four kids that's obviously why that kind of uh dismantled because it just wasn't a competitive enough uh company or content to really compete with like the cartoon networks the disney's the nickelodeon so um creating that content was really kind of a pioneer of the american uh adaptation industry and she was a very very big part of that say what you will about four kids and that content and you know whether you like the one piece dub <laughs> the four kids or not it's an extremely important part of the history of it and it's part of the reason why we are continuing to have people who are exposed to that type of content um He's truly, truly a talented person. I wish we could have talked about some of the stuff he does working with these foreign companies, bringing these titles, um, you know, from all over the world. 
to the, the, the screen in one way or another. I've worked on countless pilots um, or shows that have just never come to fruition. And as an actor, like he said, you really got to be in this for the long game. You know, very small amount of people, a small percentage of people get to book one job and that carries them for the rest of their life. You really got to spread your seeds in all different in ways. And due to the oversaturation of this industry, specifically the voiceover industry, you got to figure out ways to diversify yourself. And that's why you see so many actors who are also ADR um, directors. They're, they're adapting the scripts. They're, they're, they're also engineers. They know how to work in the post side of things. They're doing the casting. And it's why he's been able to have a long career, not only as a uh, an actor, but uh, you know, make a living in this industry. It is so competitive and so hard. I started out producing films and working in behind the scenes for eight years, like you were saying, with Tony Salerno and Bill Timoney, um, holding the boom pole in the freezing cold. I remember uh, working so long. I had I was still in college at the time, and and uh, Allie was waiting for me at my dorm and i'm like i don't know what i'm gonna be done here and she's like i need someone to let me in and they wouldn't let her into the dorm and you know the the sacrifices it truly takes to pursue this career is uh that's a whole other separate conversation but you know producing learning how to produce i remember bill timoney gave me that first opportunity working on that job and gave me an associate producer credit if i could provide something to the set that had value and i was able to secure a deal I can't remember the name of the company, but they were an energy drink company. They made like drinks, like coffee, energy drinks. And I got tons of free cases. Um, no money. It was just a tons of free coffee, like energy drink coffee for the sets, which was able to then save them money on having to spend money on coffee and drinks every day. So I got all this free product and they gave me an associate producer credit. And that has helped me develop my communication skills uh, and be more of a valuable person and communicate with other people. And that's, Working on the post side of things or the behind the scenes has led to so many acting opportunities because I was so skilled working with him on that Johnny test thing. He was like, hey, Paul, I have not met many people who are older than a lot of the young kids that I was playing that are as talented as you. I'm not trying to chalk myself up or make myself sound better than I am. But he was like, you know, you know how to you know how to act here. I need people like you who know how to act more importantly than anything. Because I don't pride myself on being a utility player necessarily. I can do wacky and fun voices and play creatures. And I've gotten really good at some things and accents I'm very good at. But in terms of being able to play, uh, you know, like those deep baritone voices, that's not something my range necessarily has access to naturally. I mean, I can get there and I can put on the deep voice. But it's not the thing that I'm going to act the best at. And I'm not going to be able to – my instruments – I'm a, I'm like a tenor, right? So let's say I'm a, I don't know, for lack of a better example, I'm a flute, right? And this company or this role, this job is looking for a baritone, like, you know, the baritone, like a, like a tuba baritone. I can make my, what did I say? I was a flute. <laughs> I can't remember. I can make my flute sound kind of like. Uh, a baritone. I can, you know, I can do a good impersonation of it, but there's a lot of people out there who know how to play the baritone really well. That's what they are. That's their instrument. So they're more than likely going to hire them if they're a good actor. Where the other people get away with is where their acting is better. And maybe they didn't think like, oh, you know what? That character can sound like that because their acting is so compelling. Acting first, acting, 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 acting. That'll be the motto of the show. All right, y'all stay tuned for the next episode. Make sure you follow us on all the social medias, um, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, all that good stuff. Uh, stay tuned for more episodes. We're going to be having some giveaways, some great guests. If you want to send in a question specifically, uh, video questions we're now looking for, email a video no longer than 30 seconds, preferably in landscape mode, uh, to info at points of experience podcast.com and we will play your video message for our guests if it's a general question great we can always use those but we'll be announcing guests as they come and uh you can send in your questions for them so make sure you're following us on social media all right y'all hope you learned something and i look forward to hearing y'all very soon 
Thanks for listening to the Points of Experience podcast. This episode was hosted by Paul Castro Jr., engineered and edited by Keith Neku Lawson, produced by Samit Durg, and brought to you by Neat Microphones and Turtle Beach.